you know, it's it's kind of like the, the title. It's, uh, it's more like a, like a plagiarized <laughs> of like the Genesis title that I have seen Warner. before from Jason and others, and then the title of the Oh, so I see these as identities, challenges, innovation, and resilience. I'm looking at refugees. What ensuring reliable, safe, and trustworthy systems? That's that's a key that we're looking for. Yes. And refugees are actually not refugees right now. They are the force, the official thing when you are going to work with the Bangladeshi government is if they are FDMs, forceful displaced Myanmar nationals. Imagine the identity. They are not given refugee status, hence they cannot be called refugees. Mm -hmm. uh, so whenever we are officially communicating with the official people. It's a no-no. If we really want to do something, we have to call them FDMs. So identity is a huge politics. Uh, it's forever. And what I'm going to do is primarily I will be talking about um, uh, my experience um, um, and uh, some of the things that I've seen. I was appalled and I was surprised and I was overwhelmed to see the level of resilience and level of innovation. And and uh, and I have to say that I am no. Um, CG person uh, expert. It's a uh, my, my primary focus have been um, you know uh, ICT for development, uh, technology for development, and technology policies. But when these things started happening, the latest exodus because Rohingyas have been asking since late seventies. But when this latest exodus happened, I happened to be there, and it totally blew my mind. And it's now right now my work is beyond Rohingyas. It's, it, I really want to see it from a displacement, global displacement point of view. But definitely Rohingyas are the overall together is a, is a very interesting, uh, very challenging case that I think we should uh, uh, can some uh, have lessons from. So Rohingya crisis at a glance, this is this what happens in the, these, these, these are the images that were taken in uh, August of 2017. Uh, so you see they're crossing the border, literally the, uh, the Naf River was the border, mm -hmm. and uh, beyond are the villages which were burning. Um, those were the burned by the uh, oh, Burmese yeah. armies and the militias, um, and uh, they are the ones who are like fleeing uh, to the boat. And those boat rides were very expensive. They had to give most of their uh, savings uh, just to have the boat ride. Uh, so when we were actually asking uh, them, interviewing them, so that was one of the things uh, that they, they talked about. So, and then, of course, um, it's a typical um, campsite where you see this used to be national forests, uh, parks of Bangladesh, which have been, all the trees have been cut down uh, uh, and all the road, like the lands have been encroached uh, for, for making ways for the camps. And uh, we are not going to go to the you know, environmental impact on the social impact and the tensions with the locals right now, but those are also huge, which we don't that see that much in the um, in the press. So, um, in in short, we are looking into 1.3 to 1.5 million uh, refugees right now. Um, primary concentrated in the southeast uh, border of Bangladesh uh, with the Myanmar, and uh, uh, majority of them are women. And a big part of them are minors, children, um, and then we have the elderly. And uh, a big part, actually, the majority of the people have been traumatized, have been injured. Many of them have PTSD. Among the women, there is a percentage that have been uh, um, uh, harassed, attacked, mutilated, sexually, and in so many other ways. Mm. So we are talking about a traumatized population. But not only that, while they were in Myanmar, they have been in open air, open air prisons. They, they, the villages, they could not move on that when you talk about mobility. And it was also, it's also crucial to understand that they were very much confined, not just offline, but also online. They were not allowed to have uh, mobile phones, uh, smartphones, or data packages uh, while they were there. Uh, and if they were caught with those, um, and they were heavily punished, and in terms of the fine-wise, um, uh, so it, it has been a huge problem for them to have access. So these are the people who have been confined there in Myanmar and then fled to Bangladesh. And beyond that, but there are Rohingya refugees based uh, 
uh, Middle East, based in Malaysia. Um, uh, just in the hope there are some also in the Thai uh, border, uh, Thai Myanmar border, but very few. Uh, and then also some are also in uh, US, but uh, not that much. And interestingly, the people, the Rohingyas who are in Middle East, Europe, or Malaysia, they are there with Bangladeshi passports. Uh, okay. It's uh, something that was uh, very much uh, diluted, very much changed, very much uh, differently interpreted when it comes to recognition from the traditional nation states. What we are looking here right now, uh, when so for the last uh, two and a half years, uh, I'm, I've been working with BRAC, which is the number one NGO in the world, and some other local NGOs, uh, and been looking into this access, this information access issue, and whatever that's related to it, women's empowerment, um, related with um, uh, security, related with privacy, related with um, uh, education, um, um, even um, renewable energy, and right? how things are when it comes to uh, gender norms, social religious practices. Uh, and what we have been looking into is this access to information as a human right for mm. the community context, which is uh, amazingly uh, unheard of, or people want to uh, ignore it. Um, across the world, and when it comes to the specifically for the Rohingyas, uh, it was people were very much surprised when we were, we were asking these questions. They were like, "Why on earth you are doing this? Why, why don't you talk about education or why don't you talk about food? Why do you need them to talk about the internet or something like that?" And uh, even more so because imagine this, and this is something that uh, many of us kind of thought it's, uh, it, it should be there, is that Rohingya do not have alphabets. They don't have, it's, it's, a, it's a oral society. And because they were so oppressed, they had some competing versions of their uh, alphabets, but they were never officialized, because there is no single version of it. And as a result, and because they, they have been systematically excluded uh, from the education system of Myanmar, um, so the education is hugely low, the literacy rate, and also, the digital uh, services or the, whatever the provisions we have or whatever the content we make for them has to be audiovisual, it has to be oral or it has to be something else. So the, that's something of a challenge. Usually what we have seen is exclusion of women in different levels. I wish, uh, as, I'm, uh, as I'm speaking right now, I'm kind of finalizing my um, camp-wide um, um, survey that I have done with around 700 to 800 uh, uh, respondents on the, their access to digital platforms. And what we have seen is, no matter where you are and which, uh, uh, which kind of class, uh, caste and creed you belong to among the Rohingya society, if you are a male and if you're a senior woman, what we have seen, they're against women to have access to any kind of digital services. Uh, if it's, uh, if it's uh, proactive, if it's smart, if it gives them the opportunity to have connections with others. So. Their, their self, uh, their, their perception, societal perception of this women's identity is uh, so, uh, what should I say, static. And it, 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 it's hugely being challenged um, by the young women, and we will see examples there. So I, I, I thought it was very sad, but at the same time, uh, bumping into different innovations and resilience uh, against it uh, gave me a lot of hope. And there are non-traditional gatekeepers of information. Um, and as 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 a uh, knows, uh, you said you know, like I, I kept talking about some of those uh, enterprises, uh, this uh, that manages knowledge, creates knowledge, and stuff like that. But that's very interesting to see. And of course, the diffusion of fake news is always there, like, uh, like before. So um, Rohingyas are not allowed. Uh, were not allowed to carry smartphones uh, in Myanmar. They were caught. Uh, they were heavily punished. And they were not issued any form of digital ID that could recognize them as the citizens of Myanmar during that time. So they have been offered in many places, many times, um, to have second, third, fourth grade citizenships, or did not even citizenship to, be, to have the residences. Uh, and uh, their political leadership refused those things. So uh, in the whole official system of Myanmar, even the word Rohingya is banned. They are called uh, illegal Bengalis. Bengalis identity, ethnic identity of the Bangladeshis who are there, uh, but majority of the uh, ethnicity in Bangladesh. Okay. So they are, they are the illegal Bengalis. So, and the Bengali is being used as uh, this N-word here in this part of the world 
So it's, it's a very um, derogatory word to look in, uh, like use. And uh, they don't ever use rolling dice. And even the UN co-opted that. It was sad. So when we talk about identity, it's very important for us to look into this. The United Nations organizations there, when they were doing those reports, they also co-opted with this. And they never used the word Rohingya in the reports that they had on the Rohingyas in Rakhine, which was very sad. Of uh, then how how do you want how do you want to make sure that you are going to change things? So then this question that come in uh, as I was uh, asking myself what 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 to share and what to share, uh, from my field experiences, how can an average uh, Rohingya refugee come and connect when they are actually not legally allowed to have a permanent connection? Meaning that once actually they cross the border things were actually not that easy for them because legally um, the Rohingyas, until now, they are not allowed to have phones or connections in Bangladesh. Uh, so what does it mean? Because they need bio biology, a biometric identity according to the Bangladesh law to have SIM cards. <laughs> and um, also, uh, can so the Chan the alphabets are also there. And what, what does it entail in terms of the cost? in terms of um, access, in terms of the risk, in, some, in terms of high uncertainties. So those are the questions that um, I, 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 I kept asking myself. And these are one of, these are the, some of the questions, core questions that kind of uh, shaped up uh, some of the uh, knowledge inquiries I have around this place, especially with the roaming beds. So UNHCR and the Bangladesh government are putting biometric IDs in place. Both, are, both things are there. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, know more from uh, Jason's presentation, and uh, he definitely will give the better framework for this. But what we have seen from the inside, some of our official reactions to this, that the Rohingyas have been very much upset about this whole biometric data stuff. Because for them, first of all, they they were saying that we have no idea why doing this. We have no idea who is going to use it. They're very much skeptical about it. And then they're saying that. If, if there is these IDs, and hear me out, they, we would like to be identified as Myanmar nationals, not just as Rohingyas. And that's very interesting because, of course, uh, then this FDM, and that's why this uh, idea of forcefully displaced Myanmar nationals idea came in. Um, and they were also pushing that if we have this ID, can we please have some ID? Uh, and they were on record for this when I was conducting the workshops, that uh, can we please have some ideas that enable us to to really to, to move to move from one place to other. We, we were not being able to do it uh, when we were in our own country. Can we do that? Can we do that after we have these ideas? If not, then what is going to do? Uh, what's the use of it? So those were the some of the misgivings, some of the uh, misconceptions or some of the distrust, level of distrust they have on this. And at the same time, what we have seen is, no matter what kind of band we are looking into, Rohingyas are using mobile phones. Rohingyas are using internet. Rohingyas came up with their alternative slow internet, which is very effective for them, and very resilient. And they are coming up with their own ecosystem, developing their own um, um, uh, audiovisual content. We can just you know here I have that, that there's, they do not have an ecosystem ready which is recognized, but uh, underground there are ways they are trying to communicate and those are not efficient. And in many cases, those are also uh, paving the way for fake news and other exploitation and so many other, um, uh, so many other bad things. So that, that's, that, that is the scenario. If those, if those are the cases, then what are the workarounds? What are the innovations? What are the imaginations we are looking at? Um, so this is some just uh, restating some of the things that we have talked about before. Many are using Bangladesh and Myanmar things, very poor, poor mobile network. 2G GPRS is all, always there. And it's very fascinating to understand. Remember at the first, uh, one of the first conversations I had here, the first statements I had during my conversation was, are we going to be able to join our conversation, a video? How? With this poor network. Because they came up with this, um, the, the, I was fascinated. So there is application called IMO, IMO, and that is very resilient, very robust, and it, I think, do video conferencing even with 2.5G or 2G or something like that, even live. So, using it, 
horrendously, like wildfire in the camps uh, for sharing information, sharing uh, video, uh, video messages. Um, and so that's something that the FTA came up with, and very, because we thought WhatsApp would be the most popular one, but it turns out that's not the case anymore. So communication with the communities, if you see, so on the left side uh, of the screen, you would see at, uh, this guy, this young guy with uh, with uh, with the where all the list of the people who are under him. So he's a community leader. He's also using um, um, a feature phone which has dual SIMs, uh, the Myanmar SIM and the Bangladesh SIM. Both are illegal for him, but they're using those to actually uh, collect and manage information of the people who they are trying to manage. Uh, on the bottom, you see is the most trusted, most uh, trusted and uh, loved uh, public service announcement, which is from the mosque. Uh, that, that, that's what uh, trust most than any, anything else. So these, these are some of the things that they use for the communities. Uh, community radios are there, but, but it's primarily pushed by the uh, NGOs or the donors, and they're not popular at all. And the government mm -hmm. is also a bit skeptical about whether or not the radios should be there, which which kind of confuses me that uh, why on earth they should be like this. So what they have done, uh, so the initial response, and uh, this is something that gives me laugh on how the governments, when they are talking about it and their, their traditional way of thinking and trying to con control information. So they came up with this uh, mobile BTS and they wanted to have uh, phone booths uh, of, um, uh, of uh, phone booths that the people should keep instead of using the mobile phones. And nobody used those mobile phones anyway, because they were like, uh, even though those were free, because they would have their own uh, uh, own uh, mobile phones uh, rather than just go and be under surveillance or be under the watch of the uh, the government officials of who talking to whom and when and where. So that was the thing. So what happened? What what was one of the main things that we have seen uh, in in terms of what uh, that push uh, towards creating new identity uh, uh, and uh, new kind of innovation? are these uh, mobile uh, repair and recharge shops. And these uh, laptops uh, have all the things in the world um, when it comes to uh, religious content, when it comes to educational videos, when it comes to um, all the video clips uh, of the uh, latest news from Voice of America, CNN, uh, BBC, and also the adult content, and also the video from the uh, recruiting video from extreme uh, extremist organizations. Everything and everything is there. And those are not static. Those are actually refreshed uh, uh, bi weekly or bi monthly, depending on the demand uh, of the people there. And not only that, they also have those, um, you know, shops. And uh, these are all the Android phones. I have also seen some iPhones there. Um, and uh, people, there are local people, Rohingyas, who actually moved before. They became the uh, angel investors, and they are investing on the people who are there with the uh, uh, you know technical capabilities, and they are coming up with uh, all these new entrepreneurial ventures while you are repairing things. And more interesting thing was that uh, so imagine these charging shops where you have uh, all the mobile phones uh, that can get charged. This one and this one camp wide, and the, you were talking about. 1 million plus people, right? And the prices are regulated in a way that uh, they kind of decided on the prices. Nobody is going to underprice uh, or overprice. And if they do it, they are going to be reprimanded or they're going to be punished by their own system. So it says, or they are going to be boycotted or something like that. So it was very fascinating. On the right side of uh, these uh, charging shops, you can see there are a lot of um, A4. Um, there are, there's a lot of uh, printing going on. A big part of printing is printing uh, images, printing pictures that they take uh, with their smartphones and whatnot. And uh, some of the, you can also see, if you can see there's a golden and blue cards. These are wedding invitation cards. So, uh, so that's also one of the services they have, very popular one, printing cards for different uh, uh, occasions. So, so these are the economies, these are the things that they have been doing, and of course these are the services definitely the donors are not giving them, 
or providing them, but they kind of figured out themselves that they have to do it anyway. And the, and the most interesting thing was I see, the, the way I've seen the evolution and the changes of these mobile shops. Uh, from, so this picture was taken in 2017, uh, November. Now, fast forward, this one was 2019, uh, August. And not only the, uh, not only the, okay, so the laptops are there, that's okay. And I will, I'll also tell you how they're transferring data. But imagine, they have the solar lamps, they have the mobile covers, they have the headphones, they have uh, different kind of stickers, they have all the accessories, and so many other very interesting things, uh, which, uh, and the solar panels, very nice uh, solar lamps, uh, which many of them are not even available in Amazon, I can tell you. There are many good ones there. And um, so that gives you the sense of resiliency and the sense of, uh, uh, you know, uh, that the normalcy that they are trying to push using these hubs. So while they're doing it, I was talking to these young kids, uh, or the guys that how, how, how are you like, uh, how are you operating? Who are the main customers? So unfortunately, first of all, women don't come. So they are very much excluded. They are not expected or accepted primarily in these shops, which is sad. Uh, but at the same time, so I was also asking, so you are, based on the demand of the customers, you are actually changing the content, but how are you transferring the content? And so that's where these uh, memory cards come in. And they have, so four gigabytes is around $1, uh, eight gigabytes is around $2, mm -hmm. and, and, and whatever you come on. So I transferred some of the things, but I could not um, use those contents because I don't look good in print, but, uh, but I have definitely looked through some of those fascinating ones and many of those things i have to tell you because they don't have localized content they have urgency to create this nation identity of learning does many of them they are like pushing to uh localize the content with uh, uh you know very uh level of uh, voice um, uh audits or what should i say the voiceovers or uh, the, the subtitles and whatnot so it, it's, a, it's very fascinating to see how they have done. So now, while we were very much frustrated to see that women are excluded, then we bumped into this UN Women in Safe Spaces, where these women are there. And this is one of the most favorite pictures I have. Can you know that? Yes. And I think I also showed it to yes. you when I first uh, met yeah. her. So imagine on the, on the back, you have this, all the swing machines, and of course, there's one woman there. Uh, she, I think, she was frustrated because she didn't get this. But and then you have all the women here, uh, you know, circling around, focusing on these things that they're repairing. And it's 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 a it's a, it's a school uh, for repairing how to how to repair mobile phones. And it was done not by the donors policy, not by any NGOs uh, intelligence. It's the idea of these Rohingya women who were sick of being excluded from the whole digital ecosystem that the, uh, the, the, the camp had. Um, and uh, one of the quotes that one of my favorite ones, and I do apologize to Kat and Yusuf Yage for using it, is that the one of the religious leaders told me that uh, people, the women can uh, talk over phone, but they should not mute. So that kind of, I didn't <laughs> define the patriarchy's expectations mm. of passive use the women are expected to. Uh, but of course, women were not, uh, uh, and, and they have so many other ways to look back. Not only that, Rohingyas, what we have seen is they're pretty much alive and uh, up and running in the online news platform. So they have local YouTubers now. Uh, they have uh, local news uh, uh, agencies all the ground. Their political leaders uh, are using social media very much, uh, but definitely under the radar, so that uh, mm. they can still uh, keep working. But these last pictures is always, it's, it's in my office, I always look at this and it totally humbles me. And this is part of this future of the internet workshop that I've been doing. And the third one we'll be doing in, uh, doing it if everything is goes open, I'm sure. Uh, we are scheduled to do it in May. Uh, so this is why we ask them about their perceptions and communication using internet. 
And this is from the first workshop where the men and women, uh, the bottom one is talking about internet is about conflict. Um, because people, the Burmese use internet, uh, use social media to kill us. Uh, so this is something that, uh, that reminds them of those atrocities. But also internet is all about communication and on the top right, you see the guy is on top of a hill because of lack of, uh, uh, lack of um, uh, network power. So they are going to the top hills to have access to the network. And they think that solar power is very important to get things going, to communicate. Uh, and then of course on the uh, top left, uh, you see the power of the internet, I think the network issue. But one of the things that the one of the women, mother, she replied when I said, what is internet to you in future? So she said, internet to me in future is the ability of me to be able to track down the bullies who are harassing my daughters over phone. Hmm. And I can punish them without moving. So <laughs> even when we are talking about a totally connected society, and this connection comes primarily from the state mechanism, even with, under that, they are having this duress of being harassed uh, and cyberbullied. And, and then they are aspiring to have a better connected world where they have the ability and agency to track down the perpetrators. So that totally puts me on the spot, like what are not with me? And why we are not actually being more proactive when we talk about uh, providing solutions. So as a, as a member of SFIS, I see it as a present and a future problem. And this is when we talk about privacy, when we talk about security, I think it's very much important to, to, to talk about the bottom billions. More so, the displaced ones, um, as Jason is saying and others, that they're forced to uh, be displaced. Nobody wants to. Uh, and then they are facing the same thing in, in much worse ways. And in many cases, what we have seen is women are getting, oh, it's, oh you are getting cyber bullets, so don't get online. So this is also used, used against them. So that's something I, I find, uh, I'm not sure how, whenever I use this uh, example, I get very much emotional. But this is something that kind of, I think, also should inspire us to mm -hmm. design more inclusively. And this is my favorite picture, where, when I was there, so these two young uh, Rohingya girls are running. That's the thing I think we should all aspire to mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about, imagine these just not as Rohingya girls, as displaced community people, young generation, future generation, running from the atrocities and uncertainties and running towards uh, a better future. So I think uh, where, and a better future of course include their own identity in their own effort. I think that should be the aim of ours. So that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for him. Thank you.